Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. Uh, and I'm sorry again to the people on the live stream that we were delayed. Uh, many people are stuck in traffic trying to get here. But it was actually a chance remark that I made to Leslie in her office that she said, you must make that the headline of your book. Whenever you speak about this book, you should begin with this headline. So this is the headline, and that is that I cannot think of any other head of state in any country, in any period, who spent so long firstly envisioning and then uh, creating a university and implement it, implementing it in every detail. In fact, I can't think of many lay people, let alone heads of state, just ordinary people who founded universities. There are many universities that have single founders. Uh, a few that come to mind are um, Rice University in Texas, the University of North Carolina, New College, Oxford, uh, founded by William of Wickham, who also founded Winchester College, which is now a school. But they didn't, in fact, involve themselves to the extent of Jefferson. And this he did all between the age of 73 and 83. Uh, as the son of a surveyor, he literally surveyed the land on which the university was built. As uh, a lawyer by training, he drafted all of the legislation for the university. And I should say as an aside, Jefferson's bills were really remarkable. Uh, he first of all wrote in plain English, for which he apologized to Joseph Cabell, who was one of his allies in creating the university, and said, I suppose I should do what modern lawyers do and try and make this as uh, impossible to understand as I can. Uh, it's written in plain English. And rather like his Declaration of Independence, most of these bills began with a preamble that explained why they were written, it gave a history and what it was that they were intending uh, to do. Uh, he, as an intellectual, designed the curriculum of the university and set out the criteria for choosing the faculty. As a bibliophile, he wrote out personally a list of over 6,000 books that were to go into the university library making it instantly the largest library in uh, the United States other than Harvard. It became overnight the equal of Yale. And remember, Harvard had been founded in the 1620s, Yale in the uh, late 1720s, 1730s. Um, th this was a very remarkable uh, achievement. As a self-trained architect, of course, he designed the university, really setting the standard for uh, university campuses. Uh, the majority of universities were largely just one big building. Think of William and Mary. There's one large dominant building that is known as the Wren Building. This was typical. Uh, Yale, uh, you know, that, that had been the largest building in America when it was uh, created. Uh, but the point is that these weren't particularly attractive. They were very functional buildings. And Jefferson, of course, famously wanted to uh, create a village of buildings and wanted to create a real community. But he went much further than that. He invited every student to dine at Monticello on uh, a Sunday evening. And if they had religious objections to coming on a Sunday, which he felt would interfere less with their classes, he invited them during the week. One alumnus said that every student had been at least once and some had been uh, twice. 
before he died. And they would usually come in groups of three or four, sometimes as much as six or seven. And he would uh, engage them all personally. I even wrote the minutes of the board of uh, visitors, that it was the governing board and still is of the uh, university. I always think that's very smart because it's the job nobody wants in a committee. And yet you get the last word in uh, explaining what that committee decided. You can put your own uh, interpretation on it to give it your own uh, gloss. And in fact, part of this book really reveals Jefferson's remarkable political skills in creating the university. As we may see, he did it in the teeth of opposition here in uh, Virginia. Uh, the, firstly, there were people who objected to the site, Charlottesville. Stanton wanted to become the new capital of Virginia. Remember, this was a time when what we now call the state of West Virginia, most of it had not been settled, but essentially was still part of modern, uh, of what was then the, the state of uh, Virginia. So there was no reason why Stanton couldn't be seen as a central place. And then there were several colleges which argued that they should be the location of the new state university. Uh, the one with one of the strongest arguments was what is now called Washington and Lee, what was Washington College. That was, that was the best endowed university in America. George Washington himself, well, not in America, but in Virginia, George Washington himself had given money to uh, Washington College. Obviously, William and Mary made a claim to become the state university. And uh, Hamden, Sydney. So there, there were a number of possible contenders. And then there was considerable religious objections for reasons we'll see. His ability to navigate this through uh, when it, there was a lot of opposition and to get it passed, uh, partly using Joseph Cabell, who was the uh, leading member of the Senate, and who really played the role for Jefferson that James Madison had played in the federal Senate uh, in the 1790s of helping him to get his policies passed. But all of this he regarded as one of the three great achievements of his life and listed them on his tombstone. And yet historians have generally just treated it as the epilogue of his uh, career. Um, there are histories of the university, there are lives of Jefferson, but really are they really combined. So the histories of the university will usually pay a certain homage to Jefferson, but this book is a combined biographical account of Jefferson and also uh, a kind of biography of the early histories of the university. And... Uh, it really argues that in order to understand the university and what was distinctive about it, you have to understand Jefferson. And uh, that, that context was crucial. Now, obviously, like the Declaration of Independence, it had flaws. And in fact, the flaws tend to get more emphasized today than really the achievements, which is... Uh, remarkable in some ways. Uh, my opening statement alone should entitle uh, Jefferson to some uh, level of uh, our admiration. Um, but some of these criticisms I agree with, some I don't. Uh, one major one, which I tend not to agree with, was that he abandoned the idea of public education to pursue an elitist project in creating the university. Jefferson put forward what was really the first attempt in this country to create a public school system, his bill for the general diffusion of knowledge, which would have given every uh, youngster age three, you know, over a three-year period, both male and female, 
uh, would have given them a basic primary education. And he tried to put a bill through uh, during the American Revolution. His critics say, well, the bill never passed and he's had far too much credit. I would only point out that there was no public education system anywhere in the world when he put that bill forward. Uh, Prussia was in the process of creating one. Uh, Russia wanted to, ironically, countries which had absolutist governments. But there was a big difference. They wanted to create public schools to strengthen the power of the state. And Jefferson wanted to create a school system to hold the state accountable and to hold government accountable so that you'd have an educated citizenry who are asking questions and using their voting rights. And then the university he partly had in mind that it would create an educated uh, elite who would, but a, an elite based on merit rather than background, that would um, put their own interests aside in the interest of the common good. But he recognized that that was less likely. He thought it more important, in fact, to have a good primary school system. And he tried uh, two times later, he introduced bills in the legislature, one only a few years before he died, to create a public uh, school system. Uh, he never gave up on that idea. Uh, the reason that he couldn't get his passed and that he opposed uh, the system of others is that he insisted it should be a secular system and that clergy should not be allowed to teach at these uh, schools. So that's one criticism made. Uh, another is that he wanted to have scholarships to the university and to have it accessible and that it be a public university. But people have put, have said, and quite correctly, it immediately became the most expensive uh, university in the country other than Harvard. And some, of course, blame uh, the cost of the buildings. And then finally, of course, like all colleges in the South, it was tainted by the presence of slavery, which has been the large main focus of uh, the bicentennial and much of the writings. It was an important corrective. Unlike the University of South Carolina and Georgia, the university never actually owned enslaved laborers. Uh, it purchased one, and that was for humanitarian reasons that you can ask me about later if you wish. Um, and uh, students were prohibited from having enslaved people. Nevertheless, Maury McInnes, Lewis Nelson estimate that there were about 200 enslaved people on what uh, is known as grounds at the University of Virginia or the campus anywhere outside of uh, Virginia. Uh, and these criticisms have uh, essentially left a rather negative impression so that the most recent general history of universities, which is written by someone called Roger Geiger, and is an excellent book. Uh, it's on the history of higher education in America up till the 20th century. But of the University of Virginia, uh, Geiger, I think, found it difficult to know where to place it. Uh, it doesn't, he doesn't place it in the chapters dealing with most of its contemporary universities. He says it's sui generis, but he also said it was basically an aristocratic finishing school, and uh, that could have no influence on higher education elsewhere. And the point of this book is to argue, actually, it had a profound influence on American higher education, and I think it's the first book to really document that that like the Declaration of Independence, it was revolutionary. It was the first secular university in America. Uh, others had attempted it, uh, Transylvania College in Kentucky. And it shows how green I was when I started this book, because someone said to me, have you looked at Transylvania College? And I left the conversation. I was too embarrassed, really, to question them and left the conversation thinking, why would I look at what's going on in Romania? <laughs> Although we forget they wanted to call a state Transylvania. 
And the University of North Carolina uh, experimented with it, but this was really the first university to do so. And uh, you know, I'm going to be stopping in a moment to uh, give opportunities for questions, but before I stop, I want to give you what was distinct about this university and how it influenced universities elsewhere and to give specific examples. But before I do even that, I did want to give you a bit of the flavor of the book um, and to make you realize that this is not just written for fellow academics. I've tried to write it in such a way that would engage students and lay readers. And I've been, it's been particularly beneficial to write this at Monticello. Every chapter begins with an extended narrative that opens the theme of the chapter. And the great thing is, this is the most richly documented period of Jefferson's life, to the point that you have accounts that make you think that you're, you were almost in the room witnessing the uh, event. I never found material of that quality when dealing with the American Revolution period. But this is a period in which people are writing memoirs, keeping diaries. And furthermore, everybody knew that Jefferson was a major historic figure. So the very first chapter begins with an alumnus addressing the 50th reunion of that very first year of students after the American Civil War, in which he describes what it was like to be in that first year. They didn't use the term class and describes going to dine at Monticello. And it's really a very amusing description because uh, firstly, it says Jefferson was going deaf in the last year of his life. And this was the last year when the university opened, but he didn't want to discourage the students from talking. So he pushed back his uh, chair at the table because what he wanted is to watch them talking to each other and to see them uh, animated. Uh, and Martha was the one who really presided, and she liked teasing Jefferson in front of the students. And so she was teasing him about the fact he didn't like novels, which Jefferson really disliked, and that he wouldn't read Walter Scott's. Walter Scott, she'd given him Ivanhoe, one of the novels, and Jefferson hadn't enjoyed it. But then she went on to say, but I so adore the legal writings of Blackstone. <laughs> As if anybody would read legal writings. She knew that Jefferson almost wanted to have Blackstone banned from the university and certainly did not want students introduced to it in the first year. Blackstone, uh, well, had been Chief Justice of England when a lot of the policies were being passed against America. And Jefferson saw him as the ultimate Tory and monarchist and thought that it would turn Americans into monarchists and Tories. He also, though, knew that Blackstone's Guide to the Law was the easiest to read and that students would be tempted to read it. So every chapter begins like a description like that. The first professor arriving from Britain and describing what it was like and how uh, the, the university seemed like an abandoned village and he moved into a pavilion and there was no furniture for him and it was the height of winter and it was uh, cold. And then he described coming up to Monticello and standing in the hallway and watching Jefferson walk in and look at him amazed and said, you look incredibly young. I and mean, the man was just in his early 20s, like a lot of these professors. And the person had the presence of mind and the repartee to say, yes, but I will get old. And at that point, Jefferson smiled and said, that's true. And they, after a while, Jefferson uh, had a great admiration for him. My other great fortune was uh, having the Jefferson papers being published here. This is the papers for the retirement period. There is a team of 10 people who do nothing but go through the papers for the period when Jefferson was creating the University of Virginia. And uh, 
they made new discoveries. Uh, they certainly helped me. Uh, it's always been assumed that we know very little about the laying of the foundation stone for the university. And I always found that amazing because there were three presidents present, including uh, James Munro, who was the sitting president. And you had to think that that would be recorded in detail. In fact, it's recorded in rich detail, not least by the Freemasons who organized the ceremony. Those documents have been published. I was able to use them as part of this. Um, the Rockfish Gap Commission is uh, the uh, basically the blueprint for the university. It, it was turned into a bill to create the University of Virginia, and it describes everything from the curriculum to selection of faculty. Um, this is a really a marvelous example of Jefferson as a politician, because thanks to the Jefferson Papers, we discovered that Jefferson had already written three drafts of that commission before the 22 or so commissioners had ever met at Rockfish Gap. In other words, he'd already written what they were going to decide. They did make a few changes, but they basically uh, reproduced it all. But by having three drafts, we can see how his thinking evolved. Thanks to our getting word project with the descendants of Monticello and the enslaved community, it's possible, too, to speak about individual enslaved people like Sally Cottrell Cole, who, was, uh, who later went to uh, be uh, the maid to uh, a professor at the university. So these stories, I think, help to really enrich uh, what is, though, meant as a uh, really to demonstrate the unique uh, ideas that Jefferson brought. And I'm going to just list those now. This is my postage stamp. And the, really the main takeaway of this evening, um, I've already mentioned one of the most important contributions, creating the first secular university in America. That remained deeply controversial for a long time time, uh, one university that copied Jefferson was University College London, the first university to be founded outside of Oxford and Cambridge. And Jefferson sent the founders of that uh, university, the first outside in England, uh, a copy of his plans, the Rockfish Gap Commission, which he was careful to have published. And obviously, because he was Jefferson, there was huge interest everywhere. Another major uh, difference uh, that really had um, an impact on American higher education was in his introduction of what he called an elective curriculum, where students chose what they wanted to study. They had to do within the bounds of three subjects. On the other hand, they had more freedom even than today. They didn't have to take any basic courses. They could take courses in any order that they wanted. So it was not, that's why they, were, they never referred to classes, because students did not study with their immediate uh, peer group. And that has become one of the hallmarks of American higher education, that Americans choose the subjects. And in a way, it kind of reflected his political views as well, of giving people choice. Whereas at Harvard at the time, although you studied a lot of subjects, you had to go through them uh, in a specific order. And there wasn't much coherence too to what you studied and uh, when. But he had a lot of other ideas. Uh, he wanted to create a comprehensive education that included basic science. So this was one of the first universities to teach uh, chemistry, one of the first uh, to teach economics, and uh, it tried to be as universal as possible. It did offer the classics, but Jefferson was really departing from the models of his time in uh, insisting that your basic education did not need to be a classical education. Three, uh, three years after he died, 
Yale produced something called the Yale Report. And Yale at the time was the most influential university in America. And that insisted that the basic education at university should be the classics. They did introduce science at Yale, but it was in the separate Sheffield School. The scientists even had to sit in a separate place in chapel. Uh, this, this was very uh, different. The pedagogy was different in that uh, he didn't want people taught by recitation, uh, that he wanted them to uh, learn instead through lectures. It was uh, virtually the, one of the first universities in America to introduce exams. Uh, these are just a few of the features. And I said uh, in my introduction it had a real impact on other universities. Uh, William Rogers, who founded MIT, was a former professor here at the University of Virginia. And his widow later wrote that MIT was founded in the corridors of the University of uh, Virginia. Um, and indeed, it has many of the same traditions, even the tradition of not giving honorary degrees. A lot of the uh, leading presidents of Harvard, the most famous presidents of Harvard, who have had an impact not just on Harvard, but elsewhere, a lot of them uh, invoked Jefferson. The first was Josiah Quincy, who only four years after, or three years after Jefferson's death, uh, had been appointed at Harvard to be president and was making his way down here to Virginia to see the uh, university. And he had to stop in Washington and turn back because he heard there was a typhoid epidemic at uh, the University of Virginia and there was a lockdown. And so he had to uh, return. Um, Eliot, uh, I think it's Charles William Eliot, uh, one of the really great educational reformers in the 19th century, president of Harvard, uh, was particularly interested in what Jefferson had done. Two of Harvard's greatest uh, young professors who uh, would play a major role in its development, George Tickner and Edward Everett. Uh, Everett's perhaps best remembered as the man who gave the long-winded and dull speech before Lincoln at Gettysburg. Uh, they both um, uh, were visiting Jefferson in his retirement, and they were also studying in Germany, which Jefferson recognized was the, uh, the cutting edge of education at the uh, time. As late as the 1960s, James Brown Conant, uh, president of Harvard, uh, gave a series of lectures and produced a book about what we could learn from Jefferson uh, for the educational future. Um, other universities, the University of Michigan, uh, the University of Texas, Austin, um, Jefferson's uh, own nephew was involved in setting up, but it is now no longer really regarded as the founder of the University of Florida. But um, it was uh, Henry Baxter Adams, one of the first professors at um, Johns Hopkins University and a noted authority on education, who said there was no university in the South not affected by the University of Virginia, but also nationally, but especially in the South, and especially the introduction of the elective um, system. Uh, and uh, that uh, you know, Adams, uh, Adams's book itself then became a major influence uh, on uh, American higher education and its uh, future. Thank you very much. And so we can take a few questions. Uh, I may repeat them as it's being live streamed so that, uh, but you've got, thank you, we do, Noah has uh, the uh, microphone if anyone would like to ask a question. Yes. Just great. Sorry. 
Jefferson initially was opposed to religious studies at the University of Virginia. Yes. How did that come about, his objection? It, it, it largely arises partly from his own religious views. You know, he always said he was a church of his own um, and his belief in religious freedom. He always made a distinction uh, not to simply speak of religious toleration, but religious freedom. But he believed that religious freedom and political freedom were essential for intellectual freedom. Uh, and his great concern was that every college in America at the time had some religious founding. And indeed, religion, we, we need to thank uh, organized religion for the original creation of universities. Uh, a lot of the language we use um, and terms and even the ceremonies of the degree are essentially secularized versions. Even terms like dean and provost uh, and the uh, words for the MA and BA, all of this comes from uh, religious, originally religious institutions. But at America at the time, you didn't have to go to chapel once a week. You generally, at most colleges, had to go twice a day. And uh, so th this was really a major difference. But his argument, and of course he was supported by James Madison, who supported him a lot in this project, but all the people who supported him said this was really his idea. You know, he deserves the credit. Madison even said we deferred to him on the board of visitors because we felt if it failed, he would be the person who was uh, blamed. Um, but his great fear was that if a religious denomination dominated the university, they would essentially use it to evangelize, and they would also exclude some fields, especially scientific uh, fields. So he saw that as a necessary condition to intellectual freedom. Beth Taylor, and I do want to just say Beth is writing a biography of Margaret Bed Smith, who uh, essentially left these wonderful diaries recording life in Washington and politics in the early 19th century, and had some of the very best accounts of Jefferson in late life uh, and uh, what it was like up here at Monticello and uh, of the university. Oh, thank you mm. for mentioning that, Andrew. Uh, did Jefferson not distinguish, mm. and if so, how early, between studying religion per se and religious studies, world religions, etc., cetera, mm. how soon was the latter part of the curriculum at UVA? Well, the UVA today has the largest department of religion at any university, but of course it's taught in a way that he would have approved of. Uh, it's treated like any other subject, something that you approach um, you know, that you approach critically. Uh, it's not being promoted as a faith, and that is up to people individually. And uh, Jefferson therefore felt that religion was best taught in uh, history classes, in language classes, um, in other ways. Um, and interestingly enough, he always classified uh, religious books in his library under topics like history and classics and so forth. Um, uh, he really disliked theology and any kind of a abstraction that could not be demonstrated uh, by factual evidence. And so he had no time for what's sometimes called metaphysics today and speculation. He said that there's just no answer to those things. It's not even worth, worth thinking about. And incidentally, I do describe him editing the Bible, especially the New Testaments. And he was doing this as he was founding the university, he began while he was president and did a first attempt. But then uh, when he um, 
the year that the bill was passed, uh, 1819, to Creighton University, he began this laborious effort of pasting, it was literally a cutting and pasting job from the New Testament, removing all the miracle stories and putting it in four languages side by side and basically reducing it to a series of moral sayings. Uh, it's sometimes today called the, uh, the Jefferson Bible, but he actually called it the life and say, sayings of uh, Jesus. It was meant to be entirely private. I, you know, he never intended to distribute it, but it shows a lot about him as a scholar. We would today call that a hermeneutical approach to uh, a text. And what he was doing, uh, a lot of modern scholars have done. There's a group called the Jesus Seminar that was founded in the mid-1980s. And they go through the New Testament arguing that some of these are accretions of time and what they think are the sort of basic truths. Obviously, it's hugely controversial. Um, but the very fact that he had the courage to do that uh, and it would have been a scandal if it had been publicly known at the time. He shared his religious views with very few. I mean, people have said he said less and less about slavery in his later life, but he also said less and less about religion. And that is that the American Revolution, a bit like 1968, people could say a lot of things uh, that would have in any other time seemed... Uh, very revolutionary, but by uh, the early 19th century with the expansion of cotton and with the expansion of evangelical conversions in the South. Today, the South is sometimes called the buckle on the Bible belt. But the fact is the buckle was in the North in the early 19th century. And as a result, and I just end the book by pointing this out without trying to explore the subject, but Southern universities in the early 19th century had the most interesting curriculums. They were the, some of the real pioneers in education. That goes completely against the general accepted view that the North has always been played the key role in educational development. Of course, popular education was more limited in the South, but even there in Virginia, uh, literacy levels weren't any much particularly lower than England, which at the time uh, was the world's leading power and the uh, world's leading industrial power. Have we? We have a couple questions online right. as well, so we can read okay. those. Okay. Uh, as long as someone tells me when I'm meant to... Uh, So these, these are questions coming from our outside uh, audience. One question is, how did Jefferson's financial woes impact the university? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, Jefferson was going bankrupt throughout this, and yet he was writing checks to university, and he was whining and dining these students. Uh, the truth is that for a long time, he did not know how bad his situation was. What really changed was the, one of the worst depressions in the history of the state in 1819. And land values halved overnight. And that totally transformed his, uh, his situation. And I mentioned this twice in the book at the beginning and the end. You know, Jefferson had this incredible dialogue and conversation with John Adams, correspondence, also while he was creating the university, which I talk about, uh, his predecessor as president. And they ask each other, if you could live your life over again, would you do it? And if so, what years would you want to relive? And they both agreed that they wouldn't want to live the years previous to 21. They didn't want to re relive their teens again. But Jefferson said, I would have liked to have died essentially in 1819. And that makes little sense because he had all his facilities pretty well until the very end. And of course, if he died in 1819, he could never have overseen 
the university. And incidentally, he was at one point supervising the entire building of the university. He was calculating the number of bricks that would be needed for each uh, building. Um, you know, you do the five mile ride uh, sometimes every day. The very last time he visited the university, he went to what's today called the Colonnade Club. That's Pavilion uh, 5, is it? Uh, seven, that's right. Uh, and uh, he sat and watched the very la first of the, um, uh, the, the columns being raised for the university rotunda. Um, but he also unpacked boxes of books and noticed that the, there was a misspelling of Edward Gibbon, of all people. And I must admit, the first time I read that, it gave me uh, chills, because Gibbon's first volume of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire came out in 1776. And the British regarded that as a premonition that this might actually be the story of their own empire. And Jefferson said to the librarian, why did you accept this? They have misspelled the name Gibbon. And thanks to our staff member here, our librarian, Andrina Tay, uh, we found the original bindings misspelled. And I, they are pictured in the book. I was very lucky. The University of Virginia Press allowed me 32 pages of color illustrations. Although the, the reason I don't mention the University of Virginia in the title is I think the university was more important than the... Uh, you know, that the, his ideas are really more important than one particular place, and that this is relevant not just to uh, alumni of the university and to its current students, but to America generally. Did I answer that question? Incidentally, I got a little off. Yes, y yes, yes, I think so. We have mm -hmm. one last question. Um, Natalia asks, do you think that Jefferson founded the University of Virginia to give an identity to the very new American people and to put the ground for the freedom of thought in a public institution. Yeah, I think that's rather well worded. Uh, and there's been some debate about why he founded the university. And there were obviously a number of influences. For one thing, he was a natural intellectual. And I do point out that he himself was engaged in teaching. He took on individual students and actually formally taught them, usually other planters and people he just encouraged. Sometimes it was just giving them lists of books to read, but sometimes he was actually formally meeting with them and giving them tutor advice, including two of his future uh, son-in-laws to his grandchildren. Um, but also, religion, I think, was very important. I mean, what I think was key was that all the other universities in America, not only were they very religious, but they were dominated by his political opponents, the Presbyterians. And the year that he actually first mentions founding the University of Virginia is the year of 1800. And that's hugely significant because that is the year of one of the most bruising political campaigns and presidential elections in our history. And Jefferson was especially bitter that the clergy who ran the universities, especially in New England, usually Presbyterian and Congregationalist, that they had um, been especially uh, severe in their comments about Jefferson. Uh, the Reverend Timothy Dwight, the president of Yale, said that um, you know, if people voted for Jefferson, we'd all be forced to sing the song of the French Revolution, the car era, and that uh, you know, atheism would become the norm in America. And the following year, he wanted his students to pledge that they would never vote for Thomas Jefferson. And even the other colleges here in the South, like Washington College and Hamden Sydney, although they weren't formally aligned, were basically Presbyterian schools. And the Presbyterians at the time, and should be given credit for this, were founding more schools and universities 
than any other religious denomination. And they were by no means all, pre all uh, supporters of the Federalists. But the, the issue was that in the North, they generally were Federalists, and that the Federalist Party, who were his political opponents, that's where they had the main support. He believed that Federalists just wanted to create uh, another Britain, and we would have monarchy, and we'd have aristocracy if they were... Uh, elected. Um, so when you say, why did he found it? Uh, yes, he was concerned that it should be a university which would help lead not only Virginia, but America. And of course, the first four of the first five presidents were Virginians. So that didn't seem an absurd idea at the time. And when he'd been president, Virginians had been dominant uh, in Congress as well. And uh, he wanted them to teach what he regarded as the real legacy of 1776, and that this would be a truly Republican university that would teach the real principles of the uh, American Revolution. And uh, so you, you are quite right. He did see himself shaping the nation and the state. A lot of people have emphasized Jefferson's state right ideas, but he was also the ultimate nationalist. I mean, after all, he, he created the language that largely defines this nation in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. For him, there was not a tension between state rights and uh, having a federal government. On the contrary, he thought what made, made this nation strong was to have a lot of localized government. His great fear, a legitimate fear, I think, and one that de Tocqueville also uh, sounded an alarm about, was that if uh, the central government became too powerful and completely uh, overshadowed local government, people would feel that they had no real influence in political decisions in America. And so not only was he in favor of state rights, he was also in favor of sort of county rights. Uh, and indeed, he wanted the school system to be funded on what we basically call a county level. He used a different uh, term of ward republics, but it, it would have been essentially the same thing, modeled incidentally on Anglo-Saxon England. But he was very aware of the need to have grassroots democracy and people feeling that they could uh, have an impact uh, and some influence. Of course, when we talk about democracy or grassroots, it's limited to, in that period to men. But I would point out, and white males, I would point out that Jefferson, unlike many in Virginia, was very much in favor of trying to extend the franchise and give more people the right to vote.